this comic book is a love story. A boy and girl in love. They get married, and after an offensively lurid description, illustrated, of course, of the couple's wedding night, the book shows how the bride murders her husband by chopping his head off with an ax. This comic book describes a sexual aberration so shocking that I couldn't mention even the scientific term on television. I think there ought to be a law against them. Tonight, I'm going to show you why. It has been said that art imitates life and has been used as a metaphor for the human experience, often foreshadowing the things to come. The superhero, beings with incredible powers coming from another world, often honored as divinity, personifying a savior of humanity. They are gods in spandex. You wrote that the world doesn't need a savior. But every day I hear people crying for one. We can save this world. <laughs> With the right leadership. Historically, these mythological stories have been used as propaganda in an effort to gain sympathy for social and political parties. Purposely creating characters to facilitate civil justice being at the forefront of various movements as a voice of liberation. Superhero mania continues to explode with each passing decade, gaining momentum as one of the most powerful genres of storytelling. Millions of adoring fans pour into theaters to escape into the fantasy world of their favorite masked gods. And to many, it's irrelevant what this movie is about. They will tell you this movie is a happening unto itself. Iron Man just missed being the biggest non-sequel debut movie in history for the first Spider-Man movie, which tallied 114 million. Are they borrowing their inspiration from the Bible, only showing you a very different side of the story? With such spiritual themes, is there an agenda to replace your worship of the one true God? One of the great American innovations of the 20th century is the sanctity of childhood. Countless billions are spent on making the modern childhood 24-7 Disneyland of indulgence and delight. Refashioning what was once considered sacred, a youthful innocence, and replacing it with a dehumanized, overly commercialized society. It wasn't always like this up until the 1930s. Kids mostly played outdoors. The television hadn't become a household item yet, and there were no video games to consume their time. But in the midst of the Great Depression, a new pastime sprung to life. The golden age of comics, a new medium of storytelling that quickly became an iconic obsession. One of the reasons for its timely success was the dawn of the Second World War, which brought fear and anxiety to the general public. And superheroes arose to the occasion, providing a means of comfort and escape. Superman, one of the most notorious heroes, didn't fight aliens or evil robots in his earliest adventures. He battled the villains that people were genuinely worried about most. Gangsters, corrupt politicians, fascists, and war profiteers. And after the Pearl Harbor disaster, superheroes became the mascot of the war effort. Comic books enjoyed circulations in the millions and became essential reading material for the GIs overseas. The story is as old as time. The only occasion we call in a god is when we are in need of him. When life is easy, we forget our need of a savior. The prophetic books of the Bible are riddled with examples of how Israel called upon Jehovah only to save them from total annihilation. In the same way, comic book fans seem to turn their attention to these colorful gods only when there is a genuine threat to society at large. 
For example, the comic boom in the late 1980s brought on by Batmania was a time that urban America was bombarded with a crack epidemic and an explosion of gang violence. Comic book creators responded to the New York Post headlines with their four colored vigilantes who went to work against the drug gangs, smugglers, and other assorted street thugs, even going as far as to portray an anti-drug stance in their cover art. The happy-go-lucky years of the Clinton administration, however, saw one of the greatest declines of comic circulation, which had brought the comic industry to their knees. This would all change in a single instance. September 11, 2001. There was a brief moment in time when the dust was settling from the falling Twin Towers that it seemed like real life was being taken straight off the pages of a comic strip. It was suddenly us against them. There were good guys and bad guys, villains and victims. The comic industry responded. The events of 9-11 tapped into a deep-seated need of someone or something to save us from the faceless, nameless evil that had incredible power to extinguish life at will. The kind of destruction previously seen only in comic books. Once again, the comic industry picked up steam and rebounded with unprecedented success. They supplied a confused, terror-driven nation with superheroes who would put things to right, saving them from the tyrannical powers at hand. So if real-life events have a direct link to the type of content that the comic industry is feeding to the masses, what is so bad about having these savior types be our heroes? Isn't Jesus Christ one of these types of heroes that has come to our world to save us from some unspeakable evil, to fight the ultimate foe and save his girl, a metaphor for the church, from Satan's arms? Is there something wrong with paralleling the great controversy between Christ and Satan? Or could these allegories be misleading? Could these be counterfeits of the great story of salvation and redemption, meant to detour you away from the truth? Subtly weaving characteristics of ancient gods into each superhero, ultimately convincing the world that Satan is our hero. How do these comic stories intersect with the Bible? And is the effect of watching, reading, or idolizing these heroes damaging to your faith and belief in the God of heaven? In order to understand these parallels, we must take a look at the origins of both superheroes and Jesus Christ. Every culture has had its superheroes. When the difference between life and death often came to the strongest and the bravest, it was only natural that the retelling of these accounts were passed on throughout the generations, each story becoming more fantastical, which became the building blocks for elaborate tales of super gods. One of the earliest known depictions of a hero was that of Gilgamesh, the Sumerian. Detailed exploits of a pantheon of deities have been discovered on Sumerian tablets, telling stories of human acting gods. Linguist and longtime researcher of the Sumerian culture, Zachariah Sitchin, has spent his life studying these myths. A basic conclusion of my writings uh, has been that those who gave mankind civilization were visitors to Earth from another planet. Uh, if I say extraterrestrials, it's a it's a dirty word, <laughs> but that's what they were. In Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, he claims that they really aren't myths at all, but rather garbled accounts of extraterrestrial beings who were sent to Earth and enslaved the human race. An interesting observation, considering the biblical account of a foreign race of beings who were cast out of heaven and enslaved the human race. The Sumerian goods and technologies, as well as their writings, traveled to other parts of the world through trading, Egypt being their closest trading partner, exchanged goods and services as well as ideas and culture. Ancient Egypt was a society almost as saturated in media as our own. Cultural artifacts were inseparable from their religious context. Hieroglyphs and picture writings on the walls of ancient tombs can be seen as a precursor to modern comic strips. The Egyptians worshipped a vast array of colorful gods, which they called the Netjir, attaining their inspiration from the nature around them. 
Some believe that the word nature is actually a Latin adaptation. Their esoteric religion focused heavily on the next world, which is death, judgment, and the afterlife. For this reason, they fashioned the god Osiris, lord of the underworld. In fact, the comic book world draws heavily from Egyptology and uses themes as well as reincarnations of these ancient deities. Osiris sat in judgment of the dead and determined whether they went to paradise or whether their souls were destroyed. The whole Bible-believing Christian world also teaches of an afterlife, a God that will judge what the final fate of each soul will be and who will be counted amongst the saints in paradise. But one paramount difference is that Osiris is the God of the underworld, for example below, and the God of the Bible is from heaven above. Nevertheless, Osiris was overshadowed by his sister and wife, Isis, who served many functions and has morphed over time by absorbing those of earlier goddesses. Isis was the mother of Horus, the hawk-headed god of kings. He was the god of the sun, the sky, and the horizons, which derived from the name Horus Stones, as some scholars believe. Horus was a star of one of the first action-adventure dramas during the 20th dynasty, titled The Contendings of Horus and Set. Set was responsible for sending Osiris into the underworld, both battling it out for kingship of Egypt like two comic book heroes. The two gods shapeshift, race boats of stone, and maim each other until Horus becomes victorious and rules the throne. The outcome of the struggle was so important that it dictated Egyptian life. Thus, in the afterlife, every king is an incarnation of Horus, and in death becomes a new Osiris. The Bible also speaks of a great battle between Christ and Satan. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven. A war in which the three main players are God, the judge, Jesus, God's son, and the dragon, or Satan, who is defeated and becomes associated with death, or the king of the dead. Both accounts having almost identical players, Osiris and Horus, which are father and son, who fought against the evil enemy, Sep. Only there is one stark contrast between Osiris and the God of the Bible. Osiris is the God of the dead, and the God of heaven is the God of the living. In biblical terms, Osiris is more like Satan. Today, Egypt's power over the popular imagination is undiminished. We see Egyptian iconography everywhere, from the back of the dollar bill, to Fortune 500 logos, to blockbuster movie characters. The trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus became central to the Hellenistic mystery cults and have been deeply rooted in the foundations of the secret orders such as Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. Esoterics from around the world have sought to resurrect the Egyptian mysteries so that the power that once built those inexplicable monuments could be harnessed again. The early Greeks and Romans essentially worshipped the same pantheon as the Egyptians, albeit under different names. Zeus, Poseidon, Hercules, and Hades all starred in fanciful dramas that were depicted in murals, friezes, poems, and statues. The gods fought epic battles against their predecessors, the Titans, and later interacted with humans in allegorical parables. The epic myths of the Greeks all centered around these godlike superheroes. The outcome of the Trojan War hinged not on the armies of Greece and Troy, but on the mighty warriors of Hector and Achilles. Cult-like worship developed around these gods. Writings like Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, were revered and fashioned like the scriptures are to Christians. Each god was assigned mastery over a specific art or science or facet of nature. Their icons and images persist to this day especially in our modern art forms such as movies and comics. The far-reaching influence of these gods 
have gained momentum through the years, becoming the subjects of a wide range of media. And yet one thing remains consistent, that there is a war between the gods. And salvation comes from a savior who is part God and part man. This is apparent in the movie Immortals. Long before man roamed these lands, there was a war in heaven. The victors declared themselves gods, while the vanquished were renamed Titans and forever imprisoned within the bowels of Mount Tartarus. King Hyperion and his legions seek to unleash the Titans and wage war upon this world. I will end the reign of the gods. If there is one human who could lead them against Hyperion, it would be Theseus. Let's analyze what you just saw. The victors of this war in heaven, known as the gods, are depicted as coming down from heaven, ordained in gold, reminiscent of the biblical god of heaven. The titans who war against the gods are chained and confined to the earth, a quasi depiction of devils with degenerating skin. And the savior comes through the seed of man to redeem humanity. Once again, a myth having the same elements as the biblical account of God's plan of salvation. As it says in the first book of Samuel 2, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall be thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. You see, the God of the Bible is in heaven, his adversaries, cast out of it, are chained to the bowels of the earth. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Theseus, the savior from the Immortals movie, is a type of Christ, being half human and half God. Poseidon is his father. According to Carl A. P. Ruck's book, The World of Classical Myth, Theseus battled and overcame foes that were identified with an archaic religious and social order. He was known as a great reformer. But he wasn't like the Christ in the Bible. Rather, he was a ruthless warrior who killed many, was a seducer of women, and established the cult worship of Aphrodite. Although it may seem that the Greek myths have parallels to the Bible, could they be telling a vastly opposing account of the great war between Christ and Satan? Let's examine another film that was released, called Clash of the Titans. This will start to unfold the twisting of the biblical plan of salvation. The oldest stories ever told are written in the stars. Stories of time before man and gods, when titans ruled the earth. The titans were powerful, but their reign was ended by their own sons, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Zeus convinced his brother Hades to create a beast so strong it could defeat their parents. And from his own flesh, Hades gave birth to an unspeakable horror, the Kraken. Zeus became king of the heavens, Poseidon king of the seas, and Hades, tricked by Zeus, was left to rule the underworld in darkness and in misery. It was Zeus who created man, and man's prayers fed the gods' immortality. But in time, mankind grew restless. They began to question the gods, and finally rise up against them.
into this world, a child was born. A boy who would change everything. The question must be raised. Why do the ancient myths have so many similarities to the accounts of the Bible, even if the myths predate the birth of Christ? The movie even goes as far as introducing the savior boy, alone with his mother, intending it to be a gross misrepresentation of Christ Jesus with the Virgin Mary. Perseus. The name of the savior boy is Perseus, which the name derives from an ancient Greek verb, Perthian. According to Carl Darling Buck, in the book Comparative Grammar of the Greek and Latin, the eos suffix is typically used to form an agent noun. In this case, bers eos means to waste, ravage, sack, and destroy. This is the exact opposite of the Savior Jesus Christ. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The thief comes to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Perseus does, however, share a common thread with Christ, in that he is half human, half God. Actor Liam Neeson, who plays Zeus, explains. And then he learns through his journey that he is, a, he is the son of Zeus. He's, he's, he's half God, and he decides to fight against it. He wants to be a man. and defend himself and go through life as a man and has no respect for these gods. Actor Sam Worthington even uses terminology associated with that of Jesus' mission on Earth. And this movie is also about revenge, which means the second movie should be about redemption and forgiveness. Except for that Christ was not here for revenge. So if this heroine savior, whose name means to waste, ravage and destroy, is quite literally opposite of Jesus Christ, who then is his father, Zeus? Is he also an opposing counterfeit of the biblical god of heaven? I'm Zeus, the king of the gods, and he uh, formed, fashioned, created human beings for his pleasure. And with these other gods, the god of war, Aphrodite, the god of love, the god of this, the god of nature, with, by creating human beings, his, his rationale was, these are my little playthings, and if they pray enough, honor us gods enough, we will become immortal. So their food is human prayer. It sounds like Zeus could be a description of the biblical Yahweh, but this couldn't be farther from the truth. Zeus is known as the king or prince of the air, according to Ephesians 2.2, so is Satan. Wherein? In time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In Pergamum, perpetual sacrifices were offered to Zeus upon his towering and famous 40-foot high tall altar, the same artifact that now stands inside the Berlin Museum. Andipas, the first leader and martyr of the early Christian church in Pergamum, was slain for resisting this altar worship of Zeus. Tradition holds that Antipas was slowly burned to death inside the statue of a bull, the symbol and companion of Zeus. The passage in Revelation 2.13 could very well be a reference to the cult worship of Zeus. I know thy works and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is, wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. The argument could be made for a Pergamum connection between Zeus and the biblical Satan, as both were considered descending gods of thunder, Zeus in antiquity and Satan at the beginning of time. Altars dedicated to Zeus Katavatis were discovered near Pergamum, Zeus Katavatis most accurately means Zeus 
who descends. Reminiscent of Jesus who said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In the History Channel's documentary about the Greek myths titled Clash of the Gods, the myths of Zeus, Hercules, and Hades are accurately told from the earliest pieces of writing that were found dating back to the second century AD. In the ancient myths, Zeus was anything but holy, as is the biblical god of heaven. He was engaged in cannibalism, incest, sexual deviance, and bouts of uncontrollable rage. As you can see, the stories have striking similarities to the Bible. A son battles his father for control of the universe and seizes more power than any god ever had. This is the story of Zeus, Greek mythology's supreme commander. To us, it's a myth, but to the ancients, it was reality. Lucifer, the covering cherub, battled for control of the universe, saying, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. An interesting parallel, as Zeus sits on top of a mountain above the clouds. And since the devil wants to be God, it makes sense why he would counterfeit the things of God. Zeus is no stranger to cannibalism. His own father, Cronus, once swallowed all of Zeus's siblings. When he is confronted with the sight of mortals doing the same thing, he becomes enraged and vows to destroy the human race with a catastrophic flood. Nine days and nights pass. The rain is relentless and the earth slowly drowns. The waters reach the peak of Mount Parnassus, which stands over 8,000 feet high. In all corners of the earth, the human race perishes. When the rain stops, only two mortals are still alive. Incredibly, they have survived the storm by building an ark. A raging flood, an ark, and only two surviving humans. The parallels with the Old Testament are striking. Another ironic biblical parallel is Zeus's son, the half-god, half-mortal man, Hercules, a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. His story begins with Zeus, the sex-crazed king of the gods, having an illicit affair. Hercules is the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Alcmene. Classical mythology is loaded with stories of gods who impregnate mortal women and give birth to uh, gods or demigods. So this demigod idea means that this person has some features that are very godly, some divine powers, but at the same time, he is mortal, he can die. Hercules' final act is one of self-sacrifice. And again, there's an interesting Christian parallel with the hero who has to suffer to obtain immortality. His life on Earth ends just as he endured it, in torment. He wants to have a heroic death, the proper death of a hero. He wants to burn on a funeral pyre. Well, when this happens, it seems to be the final cleansing. What burns away is not Hercules. What burns away is his mortal flesh, and this releases his soul, so that he himself ascends to the heavens. In death, Hercules is finally redeemed. Zeus, the king of gods, believes his son has suffered enough. He invites him to join the immortals on Mount Olympus. What we see here, I think, is that Hercules is the hero of heroes. He's the greatest of the great. And at the very end of it all, Zeus says, OK, Hercules, you've suffered enough, and you're so great, I'm actually going to go ahead and just make you a god. 
Hercules is finally going to get a kind of reward that will last forever. The suffering's finally over. In the end, Hercules is resurrected and joins his father in the eternal kingdom. It is an ending with an eerie similarity to another divine mortal, Jesus Christ. This Clash of the Gods documentary went through many of the world's greatest myths and revealed astounding similarities to the Bible. The legend of Beowulf is a fictional story inspired by fact. Today, experts are still unsure who created it, but it's believed to have originated in England in the 7th or 8th century AD, making it the oldest story in the English language. The action of the poem takes place in the 6th century in Scandinavia. But the poem itself was written in Anglo-Saxon England after the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons in 665. Christianity had recently taken root in England at the time of the writing of Beowulf. The poem reflects a society that has uh, a deep pagan background and that has stories uh, that come from its pagan past. What the poem does is it recasts these stories in a Christian mold so that its listeners would be able to keep touch with their past. They would reinterpret it uh, in a Christian way. Hercules must go to the edge of the world to steal golden apples from a garden guarded by a dragon with a hundred heads. Apples, a garden, and a dangerous serpent. This labor parallels the biblical story of Adam and Eve. Historical sources inspired not only Middle-earth's most despised fiends, but also one of its principal heroes, the wizard Gandalf. In The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf guides Frodo in his quest to destroy the One Ring. Gandalf has also been compared by some people to Jesus. He sacrifices himself, is dead, and comes back clothed in white. As Gandalf battles to save Frodo, he metaphorically dies and is resurrected as Gandalf the White. And this is one of the instances where we can see uh, Tolkien's uh, Catholic roots. A pagan god of many disguises, and a Christian savior who was resurrected. Two powerful figures from the ancient world, both seen in one main character. This is what is so unique about Tolkien. He is very good at bringing together Christian and pagan motif. The religious influences behind The Lord of the Rings are fully revealed in the climax of the epic. As the story concludes, it is not Gandalf, but Frodo, who is in a position to save the world. A close comparison of the Odyssey and the Gospel of Mark reveals some shocking parallels. Both stories revolve around the hardships of a suffering hero, Odysseus and Jesus. Both main characters have carpentry backgrounds. Odysseus was a skilled woodworker who even built his own palace in Ithaca. Jesus was the son of a carpenter, and in one passage in the book of Mark, he himself is referred to as the carpenter. But the most intriguing connection is the similarity between Odysseus's visit to Hades and Jesus's last days on Earth. Both stories begin with a banquet, Odysseus and his men feasting at Circe's palace. Jesus and his apostles at the Last Supper. Then, as their comrades sleep, both men agonize about their impending encounter with death. When Odysseus learns from Circe that he needs to go to Hades, he despairs of it. And the reason is, and he says so, that no mortal has ever gone to Hades and returned. Jesus is about to die. He has a last supper with his disciples. He despairs of life because he knows he must face the cross. Ultimately, Odysseus would travel to the underworld of the dead and return. Jesus would die on the cross 
and then rise to new life. Could these parallels be more than coincidence? Could it be that all these myths, stories, and legends are simply the devil's way of confusing the truth about God, his plan of redemption, and the quest for our restoration? No myths found prior to the second century AD have any resurrected gods. Only the ones found after have records of these ancient gods coming back to life. The earliest complete copy of the Odyssey only dates back to the 10th century AD, which means the similarities could have easily been written in after Christ's death. Yet the fact still remains that there are similarities, such as coming saviors born of virgin mothers, worldwide floods, heavens and hells, that have existed in the myths since the beginning. The reason for this is because the promise of a coming savior dates all the way back to the beginning, with our first parents in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, it was promised that a savior would come through the woman's seed. God said to the serpent, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Ever after, the descendants of God's people looked forward to the day that a Savior would come and redeem the lost. And since that day in the Garden of Eden, the devil has sought to counterfeit the prophecy of the coming Savior. A pattern that is found in almost every great civilization since the earliest recorded writings. It is for this reason many skeptics debate the existence of God. But there is one marked difference in all the Savior patterns. The fact that the Savior in the Bible, Jesus Christ, died and was resurrected again. Virtually all scholars agree that Jesus of Nazareth lived in the first century, preached about the kingdom of God, and was crucified. But what happened next is the most controversial issue of history. Did Jesus rise from the dead and thus authenticate his claim to being the Son of God? Or is this a stuff of legend and mythology? For Christians, everything hinges on the resurrection. And today, we're going to debate whether there's sufficient evidence to back it up. Joining me is Tim Callahan, religion editor of Skeptic Magazine and author of Secret Origins of the Bible. And Dr. Gary Habermas, who's considered one of the world's leading authorities on the resurrection, he chairs the philosophy and theology department at Liberty University, has written several books on the resurrection, his most recent being The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. Well, Tim, let me start with you. Uh, in your book, you suggest that the resurrection of Jesus isn't original at all, but it's merely a story that was recycled from earlier mythology and mystery religions. You specifically in your book mention the stories of Osiris, uh, Adonis, and Addis. Uh, could you explain what all this means? Well, the resurrection uh, is, again, there were death and resurrection stories uh, uh, going all the way back, as you said, to uh, Isis and Osiris, and uh, usually in Dionysus, in, uh, in a lot of the Greek mythology, he became uh, he had his own separate cult. And uh, in all of these, they die an excruciating death of some sort. Uh, Dionysus is torn to pieces and eaten by the uh, titans uh, and then they uh, rise physically from the dead. So you're saying that uh, this Jesus story then is just a recapitulation of this earlier mythology? Well not necessarily exactly a recapitulation but I, I think that uh, basically uh, the evidence for it is lacking. Okay, uh, Dr. Habermas, what's your response to that? Let's take Adonis. Adonis is probably the ancient god for which we have the clearest data that he was raised from the dead. We have four accounts that Adonis was raised. The earliest one is the second century AD. The other ones are between the second and fourth century AD. The earliest account we have for Addis is the third century AD. And while Isis and Osiris as a religion was definitely pre-Christian, there is no resurrection and Isis and Osiris. Uh, Osiris in particular is not raised. Okay, Tim, how do you respond to that? I would point out that uh, oftentimes uh, the only copies of the myths we have are quite late as far as writings go, but quite often we have uh, some evidence of the myths in the form of uh, pictures on vases of the, of the various mythic uh, characters and the situations of the myths, so we can be pretty sure that they were being told orally a lot earlier. Go ahead, Dr. Abrams. 
if we're talking about stories on vases or in other reliefs, there are still no resurrection. There are no resurrected gods for which we have influence, for, for which we have data prior to the second century. There are upwards of a hundred messianic prophecies in the Old Testament foretelling the life of Christ. The likelihood of a man fulfilling just eight of those prophecies is one in ten with 17 zeros behind it. Israel, God's chosen people, were promised through Abraham that the Savior of the world would be of Jewish descent. The entire sacrificial system pointed forward to this day. But after a 400 year enslavement to the ancient Egyptian empire, Israel began to soak in the esoteric superstitions of the mystery cults. They were then freed by the miraculous hand of God and led into the promised land, eventually building the great city of Jerusalem at the crossroads of the Mediterranean. In 217 BC, shortly after the reign of Alexander the Great, Israel found itself under the control of the Greeks. The ruler, Ptolemy Philopator, made a decree that all of Israel had to sacrifice to the Greek gods, or they would be demoted to slave status. As Israel sank lower in the ranks of society, and by the time Rome rose to power, the Israelites' desire for a savior became focused on one that would save them from their oppressors. Which is why when Jesus Christ came in a lowly, humble manner to save them from their sins, they didn't recognize him. They were looking for a kingly hero, much like Perseus or Theseus, who would lead them in a revolution against the world's tyrants, establishing Israel as the world's superior political power and bringing about an age of peace. Even to this day, the Jewish nation is still awaiting this type of Messiah to appear. Is Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one sent by the Father to be the savior of Israel and the world? Christians believe that Jesus is the only one who has fulfilled the ancient prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament of the Bible, and this establishes his messianic credentials. But most Jewish people disagree. They say the Messiah has not yet come. But where does the evidence really point? We're going to debate that tonight with Dr. Michael Brown. He's president of the Fire School of Ministry in North Carolina and the author of more than 15 books, including a three-volume series called Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. And here's Rabbi Shmuley Boteik, author of Face Your Fear, syndicated columnist, and according to Talkers Magazine, one of the hundred most important radio hosts in America. Michael, what is the Messiah? What does that mean? And why do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? The concept of Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed one. And over a period of time, God revealed to our, our people Israel in the scriptures, not my opinion or your opinion, because there are different branches of Judaism and different opinions within Judaism and, and different groups. And there are atheistic Jews and very traditional Jews and reformed Jews. And everyone has a different view. The one sure thing we have is what's written in the word. And over a period of time, God spoke to us, to our forefathers, to the Jewish people about the Messiah of Israel, that he would come and that he would die for the sins of his people, that he would be rejected by his people and yet embraced by the nations of the world and that he would come and die and rise from the dead before the second temple was destroyed if Jesus is not the Messiah there can be none because the second temple was destroyed over 1900 years ago and the scriptures go on to say that he would have a priestly ministry which is one of atonement which is one of making people come back to God reconciliation just like happened with me that through him the Gentiles the the knowledge of God would go to the Gentiles around the world and then he in fact would be embraced by his own people and would return. And Shmuley, why don't you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, specifically? Well, I believe that Jesus is the Christian Messiah in the sense that he brought divinity and redemption to the non-Jewish nations of the world, and Christianity is a great world religion. He is certainly not the Jewish Messiah, because the Jewish Messiah is a radically different notion to the Christian Messiah. The Jewish Messiah has a political mission as opposed to a spiritual mission. We don't need a God-man to bring us closer to God. We don't need an intermediary. God says clearly in the book of Samuel, he is not a man. It is absolute sacrilege in Judaism to believe that any human being is a deity. Also, and most importantly, the Messiah must fulfill the Messianic prophecies, Isaiah, Isaiah 11. He must uh, cause the wolf to lie with the lamb and change human nature away from belligerence and animosity, even animal nature. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2, he has to cause men to beat their swords into plowshares. He has to bring about 
universal dominion of peace. Okay. We live in, in a let... world of indiscriminate slaughter. We let live Michael in a respond. world Let's... where there is no justice and the Messiah has not yet come. Okay, Michael, what about uh, the fact that we don't have the peace that uh, Shmuley says was to be a, a, a prophecy for the coming of the Messiah? Well, first he, he quoted some of the prophecies, prophecies I firmly believe. He left out the other prophecies because Jesus fulfilled those, and only Jesus fulfilled those. For example, prophecies like Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49 and Isaiah 50 and Isaiah 53, which, which speak of the suffering of the servant of the Lord and being rejected by his people and yet being accepted by the Gentile nations and bringing healing and redemption to those who believe in him. Shmuley also made the amazing statement that the Messiah's mission was political versus spiritual, and then he quotes all of these spiritual passages like Isaiah 11, which, which speak of the whole earth being filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, and Isaiah 2, which speak of all the nations streaming to the God of Israel. Of course it's a spiritual mission. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Most of the world miss the Son of God because they were looking for the wrong hero, worshiping strange idols and false gods. Paul says, Idols are actually demons. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Satan was so successful in confusing the whole earth about the arrival of the greatest saving hero, the God of the universe who left his royal throne in heaven to humbly save us from eternal death. By not recognizing who he was, we nailed him to a cross. Satan was victorious in blinding people from the greatest cosmic event simply by using mythological stories. What if he's doing the same thing again? Flash forward 2,000 years. Hey everybody, I hope you guys liked that clip. Those came from a couple documentaries called The Replacement Gods where we actually unmask some of these superheroes and show you the stories behind them. You should check them out. You can look at them at, uh, on our Vimeo page. You can rent them. Uh, you can also purchase the documentaries from littlelightstudios.tv. If you want to hit that subscribe button to our channel, you'll get notified when new videos come out. And if you want to support us in this work, check out our Patreon page. We've got a lot of cool perks. And uh, look at some of these other videos that are over here on the side. We'll see you later. God bless.